My personal digital revolution moment occurred at a Starbucks as I was waiting for a coffee. So I'll act it out. So I was on, the friend, on a friendly, friendly basis with the young lady who was behind the counter. How are you, she asked. I'm on the front page of the New York Times today. That's great. I showed her the paper. The headline read, Hero of the Bronx, now accused of betraying it. <laughs> Homegirl passed my triple shot skim mocha across the table and said, uh, this one's on me. <laughs> so that story uh, resulted from a small but very loud group within the social justice industrial complex who, to their credit, uh, were effectively harnessing the power of social media to amplify their extremely distinct point of view. The New York Times used that group's year-long social media smear campaign against, aimed at me um, and also uh, my client uh, as sort of a, as permission to unleash sort of deep-seated and fairly ugly bias. Um, in their case, uh, this their inability, their collective inability to accept that I, despite being born black, female, and poor, um, had a certain level of influence despite being wealthy or elected. And with that, so the New York Times kind of did seem sort of like a willing executioner and folded, you know, the activists, you know, conveniently packaged little narrative into the newspaper's kind of typical portrayal of a portrayal of women and some people of color um, at that that it happens over at that old gray lady. I did, however, also find it slightly ironic, or as I like to call it, their attempted character assassination was actually printed on April 5th, 2013, the day after the 45th anniversary of Dr. King's actual assassination. Now, the article was a little more than a gossip piece. Um, it talked about my looks, my megawatt smile, which of course they got right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, and oh, and my, one of my favorites was since I didn't answer my own office door, I was essentially hiding from authentic and deserving community members. And the Times literally printed the phrase, her neighbors have long gossiped. My next door neighbor is like an 86 year old Guyanese guy. He's not always gossiping about me. I can assure you about that. But, and they did this instead of subjecting the story to any like real journalistic um, rigor. As a matter of fact, I did speak to the, the, uh, the, uh, the editor of the uh, Metro section that was responsible for putting that up. And she actually, in their defense, said that the article was actually fair and balanced in the era of Fox News. So, okay, okay, yeah, all right, sis. So one of my many favorite My Angelou quotes comes to mind here. They see my glory, but they don't know my story. My hard-won accolades and awards didn't really start to come, you know, until my 10th year in the field. Yet according to the Times, my rise was meteoric, somehow implying that it was quick and easy and probably not deserved. Just kind of lucky, I guess. Now, it didn't matter that by that time, I had actually logged more than 15 years creating leading edge community environmental methods, created jobs, created tax incentives that for environmental improvements that passed both City Hall and Albany, brought down tens of millions of dollars city, state, federal, and private um, for positive uses back into the South Bronx, barely after you know, the, the South Bronx had stopped smoldering from the Bronx's burning days. The day that story came out, I went to an evening rehearsal in my neighborhood for this participatory theater project that my consulting company had sponsored as a way to get real-time local input uh, about local needs and, and, and aspirations of what people wanted to see in their own community as a way to inform our future real estate development projects. Now, none of those folks were activists. Um, they were just neighbors. They were regular people, you know, some with jobs, some looking for jobs, you know, some owned businesses, some just, but many just hustling straight up like we do in the Boogie Down. What they, but they were all open to the possibility of exploring what it was actually like to, to recognize that you don't have to move out of your neighborhood to live in a better one. 
something that I have actually said so often that now it is actually part of the permanent collection at the, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC. So yes, I, I, it is really cool. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet either, but I can't wait. Um, so, but there are a, so there were a dozen or so neighbors like sitting in this room in this little church, um, you know, basement. And, and I brought copies of this article because I did not want my friends and neighbors to think that I was hiding anything from them because you actually can't get the Times up in the South Bronx, seriously. And I was kind of happy about that, frankly. But, you know, but it had been all over the internet at that point. So, so they took the paper and quietly read the article and then they looked up incredulously. You know, and after this like crazy hand waving kind of flustered storm of outrage and disbelief that someone and something that, that something like that crazy could be printed about someone that they knew that they personally and, and prof often professionally benefited from the work that I'd done. And but the, one of the funniest rebuttals came from from this, the youngest member of the troupe. And he was like, yo, they just jealous, yo. You are a star. <laughs> they probably still stuck behind their little keyboards, you know, thinking that you're trying to make you feel bad, but really, really, they just want to be you. <laughs> Y'all hate is going to hate. <laughs> I was like, all right. So, but it felt good for that moment. It really did, because I felt the love, like you would not believe. And you know, and even reading the online um, comments after, under the article in the New York Times, and after a while I kind of said to stop doing that too, um, the, many of them were actually comments fully in support of me and understanding that it was just like crazy pants. And, um, and there were also lots of comments about you know, the Times even publishing such a thing, because it was such a hatchet job. But still, it hurt to have been found guilty in the court of a bunch of billies, like sitting in their little cyberspace basements and uh, with a lot of time on their hands. Rationally, I could totally dismiss, completely dismiss, you know, this, but it's tough to know that when you Google my name, it is still one of the top five things that come out. Yeah. But what I learned from my colleagues who got trashed in the pre-digital age, say if something came out on you back in like 1993 or so, it popped up for a day, a week, a month, whatever, and then it was pretty hard to dig up after that. Now, mean press can stick, I mean literally stick to you for like years at this point. But the only real solution for that is to keep on doing great things which is what I'd be doing anyway. So it worked out for me, and maybe, you know, maybe I'll get some good press, maybe I won't, but you know, I'm still gonna do what I do. You know, I'll continue to live my life in the real world, not an electronic one. And I do really have to thank the digital media trolls out there for getting me on the front page of the New York Times and all of page three, because that's like, not many people can say that actually. Um, <laughs> and I did, I learned so much from this. It's always good to know who your friends aren't. <laughs> it makes it really clear. My little haters are still totally out there. Some of them are probably watching this. Hi! <laughs> and I love you. I do. I think about you. Well, I don't really think about you that much, but I mean, you're in my prayers and stuff, I gotta tell you. Um, I actually do call them the Majora Carter fan club because, you know, you kind of have to. And they kind of scamper away when they see me, and most can't even have a real conversation with me if they actually do see me on the street. But, you know, they gave it their best shot. They did the best they could. But another thing I learned, yeah, they did. But another thing that I learned is that it's also important to appreciate the friends you do have, friends from all over the world, friends that I didn't even know I had who saw that article were just like, like sending love like you would not believe. And some of the members of that advisory, of, of that uh, a theater troupe uh, actually got together with me and other members of the community and produced all sorts of great work and as a result of that fiasco. But maybe the best part is thank God, I am still here. I am even more secure about the direction that I need to take to improve the, the long-term outcomes of this city my city, and cities around this country. And I'm on the verge of even greater victories than the ones that actually got me here. 
And to be honest, nobody of any consequence gets, you know, as up too far, you know, without taking a couple few hits. And, you know, this will not be my first or my last. But assuming that this time still stays in business, <laughs> you just may see this megawatt smile gracing its cover once again. Thank you very much. <laughs>